All right, picking up where we left off with our mesh analysis example. This is where we were. Here was our circuit, a couple of sources, uh, various RLC components, and we had gone through a basic uh, KVL summation on each of these loops and eventually derived some equations. The pair was down here. So that was the general approach, and it'll work fine with uh, a mixture of voltage sources and current sources. Today we're going to look at uh, an inspection technique, which if you have all voltage sources, which this circuit clearly is just voltage sources, um, will be a little bit more foolproof and certainly a little bit quicker than what we went through here. Okay, boom, it's like magic. It's a blank slate. Same circuit. Okay, so here's what we do. We define our two loops just like last time. So here is loop number one, current one. Here is mesh current loop number two. Now, when we went through this the first time, what we did is, using KVL, we looked at the sum of rises and the sum of drops. One thing we did was to look at our constants, like E1 and E2, these fixed values, put them on one side of the equal sign, and then the uh, voltage drops, basically in Ohm's law form, in a uh, current times impedance form, on the other side. So we would say, all right, I've got this minus this, because of the relative signs, right? The, the uh, reference polarity is minus to plus, and then plus to minus, so this shows up negative. And that has to equal the drop across this pair plus the drop across that resistor. And then we went in using the mesh currents. For example, over here, there's two currents, I1 and I2 fighting. So we would say that's I1 minus I2 times the 20 ohm. Okay? All right. Bearing all that in mind, remembering what's going on here as far as the uh, contributions of either one loop or two looping currents, this is what we find. Let's take that first part with the sources and do that. Okay, so as we go around this loop, this first loop, you know, you would still say plus, minus, plus, minus, just the same way we would have. Okay, I'm not even going to have to bother with that right now. Um, what we will do is simply look at the reference polarities on the sources, minus to plus, plus to minus. So that's going to be E1 minus to E2. All right. Now we ask a simple question. What components does I1 flow through? Because I know that that's going to be the sole current through these, but I know it's going to be one of the currents flowing through the 20. Okay, so what do we have? Well, I've, on the resistive end, I've got an 80 and a 20. And on the reactive end, we just have the J20. So those are all the contributions as far as I1 is concerned to the voltages. And then we ask, well, is there anything in this loop that's also in another loop? Now, in this case, we only have one other loop, I2. So that is uh, obviously fighting. Remember, we said it was I1 minus I2 as far as the drop across the 20. So that shows up as a negative 20 ohms times I2. All right, we simplify this as 100 plus J20. We plug in the values for E1 and E2, right? And um, we will wind up with 9 at an angle of 0 minus 12 at an angle of minus 90 equals... 100 plus J20 times I1 minus 20 I2. All right. All right. Turning our attention to the second loop, we ask that same question. What is I2 flowing through as far as components? What do we have as far as sources? All right. We only have the one source. That's E2, and with the direction of I2 and the reference polarity of the source, that's minus to plus. So that shows up as a positive. And then we have that flowing through the capacitor 
and the inductor, the sole element there, but it also flows through the 20. So we say, okay, you know, what things does I2 flow through? And we would just, um, I'm going to leave a little space here. But that's going to be the 20 ohm reel, the minus J75 for the cap, and the plus J50 for the inductor. That's all times I2. And then we say, do we have anything in this loop that's common with another loop? We only have one other loop, that's I1. So, yeah, the one item is uh, a 20. Okay, we've got this uh, 20 ohm resistor. So, again, that's going to be an I2 minus I1 when we look at this loop. So that shows up negative again. And we have um, that negative 20 times I1. Plug the values in. So this becomes 12 at an angle of minus 90. Okay. And we've got a negative 20 I1. And then this turns into... 20 minus J, 25 for I2. There's our two equations. Now if we go back and we look at um, the equations we had from before, we're good. We've got the exact same things. Okay? Almost in one step. You know, you can just look at this and go, yeah, okay, I've got uh, 20, 80, that's 100, J20, bang. Common element, 20, okay, there's that. I look, come over here, and I go, what do we got? And I got a 20, and minus J75, a J50, okay, that's 20 minus J50. What do I have in common with the I2 loop? Um, oh, yeah, I got the 20, okay, that's a negative 20. We're good, right? Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, let's modify this circuit just a little bit, just to show you how quick this can, in fact, be. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to add a little bridging element up here. Do this in exciting green. Uh, let's add a capacitor here. Okay. Uh, let's say that's, I don't know, maybe 100. Maybe this is, uh, let's call it minus J100. All right. How would this change? Right? How would these results change? Well, I'm going to make this the third loop. Let's keep these two loops the way they are. Okay. So how does this change? Well, when we look back here, I'm just going to pick this up kind of where we left it off. All right. Um, we look at the loop one, we say, what's I1 going through? Well, it's going through, again, the J20, the 80, and this uh, other 20 ohm um, resistor. Okay. So the 80 and the uh, 20 gives us the 100, and we got the J20 there. That doesn't change. And it's still 9 minus the uh, 12 at an angle of minus 90. Okay, is there anything common with loop 2? Yeah, well, that doesn't change either. There's the 20. Okay, however, we do have a loop 3. So we can say, well, is there anything common between loop 1 and loop 3? Yes, this is going to show up negative, as these meshing loops always do, right? I1's going this way, I3's going the opposite way. This is why we do these things um, always clockwise. It's always going to wind up being that way. You know, if we just had sort of random directions, clock, counterclockwise, clockwise, um, you know, sometimes they would add, sometimes they would subtract. Who knows? So this way we have them all going the same direction. It's always going to be this way. One's going to be coming one way. One's going to be going the opposite way. So, yeah, we do have something common with the I3 loop, and that's 80 minus J20. All right, so that's my I3 loop. Now I turn my attention to the I2 loop. What do I have for sources in there? Well, I've got the E2, right, the 12 at minus 90. That's positive because it's minus the plus. What elements does it go through? This hasn't changed, right? It's still the minus J75, still the J50, right? It's still the 20 ohm resistor, so we still get 20 minus J25. That doesn't change. Is there anything common between loop 2 and loop 1, the 20? Right, doesn't change. However we do have a loop 3 now. So we say, yeah, you know, the, the minus 20 is common with loop 1, but now I have to go back to loop 3. Is there anything common with loop 3? And again, this is going to show up negative. It's that capacitor, right? So um, we're going to subtract off this negative J75 times the I3. Now, of course, because we have a third loop, we also have a third equation, 
All right, so here's our first equation, three unknowns. Here is our second equation, three unknowns. And now for our third equation. So we go around the loop and we say, hey, do we have any, uh, any voltage sources? No, we don't. There are none. Okay, we don't have anything. So that's just going to be zero. All right. Now I'm going to sort of jump ahead. I'm going to leave a little space in here for I1 and I2 and uh, just sort of jump ahead to uh, the elements that are in I3. I know that's going to be positive. Okay, what do I have in there? Well, I'm just going to add them up. On the real end first, there's an 80 and there's a 100. Now, on the uh, uh, um, reactive side, we get a J20. We have a minus J100. And then coming back home, we have a minus J75. That's all times, squeeze it in there, I3. Okay? All right, so, you know, what do we have there? Well, that's going to be 180 real. And then over here, that's, uh, what do we got there? 175, that's 155 minus J. Okay, for that piece. All right, do I have anything common between loop 3, our current loop under inspection, and loop 1? The answer is, yep, we got the 80 and the J20. Now remember, those show up negative. Okay. Because again, it's going to be I3 minus I1, given this reference, this clockwise reference. Now, do we have anything common between loop 3 and loop 2? Yeah, we've got this capacitor, minus J75. Right. There's that equation. Okay, three equations, three unknowns. All right, let's um, put these all together, okay? So this thing is uh, 12 at an angle of minus 90, minus 20 times the I1. We've got um, 20 minus J25 for the I2, and then a negative, negative J75 for the I3, okay? Our th third equation, negative 80 plus J20. Oh, excuse me, uh, is that a, yeah, plus J20. That's times I1, and now we have, let's see, what's our next item? The minus, minus J75 times I2. And finally, we have a 180 minus J155. Okay? Beautiful. All right, now let's go check and see what we have. Okay. Do we have diagonal symmetry here? I'd like to do the diagonal symmetry just as a cross check. You know, I said it's very easy when you go through this to sort of accidentally drop a sign. You know, a minus sign turns into a plus sign, a plus sign turns into a minus sign. Sometimes when you're doing things like this, one plus one is 11. Go figure. You know, in the heat of the moment, things happen. So let's go check. Do we have, in fact, diagonal symmetry? So again, we kind of come off perpendicular to here, like so. All right, so here's our major diagonal. I see this negative, negative J75. That's good. I see a negative 80 plus, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, look. I got a plus J20 and a, a, and a minus J20. What the heck is going on here? All right. I know. I'm not going to go any further. I know. There was a, there was a mistake here. Okay? Um, just to jump ahead real quick, we do have the minus 20 on the, uh, 
on the, the uh, other pair, so I don't have to worry about that. But I got a problem here, so now let's go back. I have to have diagonal symmetry, right? You would think I did this on purpose. Um, I have to go back and see, well, which one is right. Hey, maybe they're both wrong. So let's take a look at this equation again, right? E1 minus E2, coming around here. Sum the things up, 20 and 80 is a 100. I've got a plus J20, that looks good, okay? This part looks okay, you know, with the, uh, uh, the common element is 20. Okay, now this is supposed to be the common element between loop three. Well, there's an 80 and a J. Ooh, there's my error. That's supposed to be a plus, which is what I had over here. Hey, diagonal symmetry saves the day, okay? All right, a little uh, histrionic maybe? I don't know. You'd be the judge. Um, so we can continue with this idea. You can see that um, the idea of uh, uh, this inspection approach is generating equations for us very quickly. Um, even when we do make the occasional error, we can pick it up over here. Okay? All right. Um, what happens if you have current sources? Well, you either use the general approach or you go and do a, a source conversion, right? So if we've just, for example, very quickly, um, you know, maybe we've had uh, something like this out here. We have a current source. Okay, we could take this and do a source conversion on it, which would be, of course, a uh, resistor in series with a voltage source, and just use that. And, of course, this would create, you know, another loop. In this case, this would create a loop four. And we would, again, follow this. We would have four equations and four unknowns. And off we go, right? So it's a, it's a nice approach to take if you have all voltage sources. The one thing I will caution you about, though, is when you do these like, source conversions, for example, and the same thing would be true with nodal, if you had something where you had a voltage source and you had to turn it into a current source in order to get the, uh, uh, the ability to do the inspection technique, there is a change that is worth spending just a moment on. And that is, when you do a source conversion, you might remember that the rest of the circuit behaves the same. That doesn't mean that the thing that you converted is the same. In other words, it would not necessarily be the, same, the, the, the case that the voltage across this original resistor and the current through it would be the same as the one you converted. Right? As a matter of fact, you don't expect it to be. They're both going to the same node. But this resistor is going to ground, and this resistor is going to your converted source. So I don't expect that to be the case, right? If you did do a source conversion, and the question was, hey, what's the, uh, you know, what's the voltage across here? Well, what you're going to have to do is solve values back here. In this case, that's actually trivially easy, because um, it happens to be the voltage at this node, which um, you could get very quickly through the, through the J50, okay? Just using a little Ohm's law on that. Um, so that's something to watch for, but otherwise, um, you know, I think we have a, I think we have a winner here, as they say.